right. Well, good afternoon, and first off, I'd like to start out by thanking you guys the New Mexico Beekeepers Association for um, having us here and for all the work that you guys did with us this year. Um, we wouldn't have been able to, to handle our uh, honeybee health survey with, without your, your guys' help and, uh, and locations to survey and take a look at. Uh, basically what I, I kind of want to go into is our what we're doing as a state for pollinator protection and, and what we're starting to look at as, a, as pollinator protection plans go. Um, Basically, uh, in 2014, there was a presidential memorandum uh, to create a federal strategy uh, promoting the health of honeybees and other pollinators. Um, to notice that there was a decline in, in honeybee colonies and, and die-offs every year, so they wanted to start trying to figure out a way to to handle that and decrease those uh, incidences. Uh, basically, EPA was kind of uh, put to the forefront uh, as the, the leader in, in putting together a task force uh, to head, head this plan. Um, they started off by looking at some of their uh, pesticides, um, putting bee advisory boxes on pollinator toxic pesticides, and then um, further moved down last year into asking states to start thinking about creating pollinator protection plans. Um, Basically, what the, the national goal is, is to reduce uh, colony loss to no more than 15% uh, each year uh, within the next 10 years. The Be Informed Partnership is basically the one that has been running a lot of surveys, uh, gathering data of what's going on, uh, gathering data of how many bee losses there are compared to apiaries around the nation and uh, they were partnered with EPA in, in providing the data to, to support this initiative. Um, the National Agricultural Statistics Sur Surveys are what usually comes of this, um, these cooperative uh, functions in, in providing that data and then it's later published uh, out to the states and, and, and nationally on up all the way to the president. Um, basically, in New Mexico, what we've considered is, is we want to take an initiative in, in uh, promoting pollinator protection, um, maybe not with something specifically on paper. We, we do want to have some guiding documents, but we don't want to make it laws that laws specifically um, hindering one group, whether beekeepers or, or, uh, or growers um, and applicators. Uh, if we go into looking at a few maps, they've, they've asked states to look at this individually. As you can see, there's a big difference in ecosystems throughout the, the continental U.S. and also in agricultural uh, commodities produced. This lends itself to really hindering a, an overreaching pollinator protection plan for the whole United States. So in, in essence, we were able to take that and run with it. And luckily, over the, the last two years, we've been able to start using this kind of as our guide to, to rebuilding an, an apiary program at, at the state level. Um, as you can see in New Mexico, there's even somewhat of a difference in, in areas uh, in ecosystem diversity. Uh, throughout the state, you get, you get a lot of rangeland um, and drier climates, and then down along the Rio Grande Valley and over into the southwestern corner, close to Arizona, you get some some greener areas with more um, water that that are likely to have a little more support for for bees and apiaries. Um, one thing we we really want to do is, and feel free to to interject with any questions or comments. What we're looking at is really getting your input, the input from growers and applicators on what's going to be the best way to
protect pollinators while still allowing everybody to do the job that they, they need to do. Um, so feel free to stop me and, and uh, give any comments or ideas on what you, what you want to see a pollinator protection plan evolve into. Um, moving forward, if we kind of look at New Mexico bee losses, we're somewhat lucky uh, in the sense that in the southwestern part of the U.S., we tend to have lower uh, colony loss than, than other regions of the country. But in the southwestern region, New Mexico tends to rank a little at the high end with a 30.6% average colony loss, which we'd really like to try and get that decreased and meet that 15% goal. Um, moving forward in, into a lot of the effects that um, or a lot of risks that pollinators see. We have just a myriad of effects, that, um, all the way from pathogens, mites, um, pesticides, no, no nutrition or lack of nutrition. And really, what we need to start doing with the pollinator protection plan is eliminating these so we can figure out what our real problem is. Um, and this is what we what we worked on on starting with like our bee health surveys, starting to, to work on eliminating some of these factors so we can narrow it down and, and figure out where we where our focus needs to needs to be um, without wasting time and resources on, on something that's not an issue in our state. Uh, as far as NMDA goals, obviously we want to promote pollinator health. Uh, with our pollinator protection plans focused on, on providing awareness and communication between all parties involved. Um, the number one thing, if, if we can get landowners, growers, applicators, and beekeepers all on the same page, we can have a lot more influence in, into to moving the process in the right direction. Most of these, most of these individuals aren't, they're, they don't want to hurt bees. They know that they're they're a viable part of their operation. Also, they just don't have the the knowledge or the uh, communication to be to know where maybe where hives are located, maybe what they might be using, how that's going to affect um, somebody's hives or apiaries. Um, then we want to inform other agencies like uh, city parks, road rate roadway departments um, and other state organizations on, on maybe practices that are bee friendly. Uh, a lot of times you see spraying like on roadways, maybe using products that are uh, more bee friendly or planting uh, certain flowers or plants that they, they might not even have to spray and that bees can forage off. Um, then we definitely want to get into to relaying the idea of bee watch programs. One of our big initiatives that, that we've got funding for, um, we'll get more in depth later, is our drift watch and bee watch and field watch programs. And these allow uh, apiaries to go online and register their location. And basically, it informs uh, growers and applicators that there may be a hive in the area. So they're going to go do a pesticide application um, to make them more aware of what times to maybe do the application when bees aren't out, out flying or uh, foraging, or if they can potentially even avoid the application. So starting with last year, um, we started our uh, honeybee health survey. This was conducted a few years back in uh, 2012 then kind of dropped off. We started this back up in 2015 and anticipate based off of uh, pending funding that, that we'll be able to complete it in 2016 also. Um, what we focused on was basically pathogens, pests, and uh, different other effects of, of bees. We also took uh, samples, at, or you guys took samples at each of the locations of honeycomb that we that we're in the process of, of running for pesticide residue analysis. Um, 
Another area that we've started focusing on is awareness with a lot of our outreach programs and uh, awareness campaigns that we'll get into with a little more detail coming up. Um, basically, for our 2015 honeybee owl survey, like I mentioned, we wanted to determine the pests affecting aviaries in our state and acquire data to, to make our informed decisions on, on rules and, and laws, um, possibly going down the pipeline. Um, a lot of times we'll get asked by legislatures, okay, what, what data do you have on this issue concerning bees? Um, is, is pesticides a big, a big factor? We wanted to, to be able to relay that by taking our samples and, and processing those um, and give them an actual quantifiable data in that sense. Uh, you guys, New Mexico Beekeepers, have surveyed uh, 24 apiaries throughout the state. Um, and our preliminary results, uh, as far as bee pests and pathogens, come, came back as showing a high varroa mite count in, in a lot of these apiaries, um, especially in, some, in a lot of the urban colony areas. Um, our bee samples have not been completely analyzed yet for viruses. I know that I got notification from uh, USDA that they, they had started the process on, on doing the virus analysis. Hopefully in, within a couple weeks we'll have a, an actual actual results from that. But with our varroa counts being as high as they were, um, it's likely that we are going to see quite a few viruses throughout those, those eight periods. Um, Comb samples, they've currently been run through one of our labs. We have two labs working on these samples. Um, one of the labs is actually a university lab that's uh, processing the samples and getting them ready for our state chemist lab uh, that'll run the, the analysis. In 2016, we anticipate being able to con conduct the same survey. Um, hopefully we'll get, be able to get a look at uh, more apiaries and, and take, possibly take a look at some of the same apiaries, see if uh, anything's changed, if my counts have possibly changed. But really what we want is if you guys have at least eight colonies in your apiaries and you're willing to, to let us or uh, come and look, take a look at them and conduct the meeting, survey that would be great to get more a more diverse uh, picture of, of what's going on in the state. Um, we want to also collect additional data hopefully from actually collecting bee samples and pollen samples so we can take a look at what kind of pesticide residues may be <coughs> present in those <coughs> samples. Um, a little bit of difference in, in collecting pollen and actual bee samples that gives us an idea of almost immediately what the, the bees have been running into in, say, maybe the last week or so, whereas a lot of the comb samples, uh, after some research, we can show pesticides potentially up to seven years back in time. Uh, moving on into our kind of our pesticide testing program, we've been able to get a lot of funding uh, through state appropriations for our, our lab. We have a mass spec over here that basically once the comb is processed and we get all the sticky stuff out of it, get all the wax all out of it, um, and take the actual liquid sample that we get, they'll be able to run it through the mass spec. Um, this is about a $200,000 piece of equipment that the state obtained. Um, in which we can take a look at up to about 400 different pesticides, uh, commonly used pesticides, and see if there's any um, any residues. Almost, I think it, they were telling me it can go down to parts per billion, which uh, most lethal levels are, are measured in, in parts per trillion. So we can get a lot more data out of that. And then once we get into working with some of the bees. And if we have like an, an idea, say if, if a bee kill happens or something, um, feel free to call us. We can go out there and take a look and definitely figure out what's happened. And if we have an idea of what product
products may have been used, if there was crops in the area or roadway spray. Uh, we can run it through our gas chroma, uh, what they call it a TC unit, gas chromatography uh, machine, and get actual levels of that and determine if, if that's what, what hit the beam. <coughs> And then now moving on to pollinator awareness. This is probably, like I mentioned earlier, one of the most in, important areas of protecting pollinators, at least from uh, pesticides and, and different types of applications out there. Um, we really need to start communicating with our custom applicators. Obviously, we're here meeting with you guys um, and then growers within the area that you guys may be keeping your beehives. If they know that hives are there, and what's going on, and, and what what their practices might be doing, we can, can definitely mitigate those risks. Um, this slide, we have a couple of the, the people. These are uh, kind of what I call our busy bees out there, working with a lot of the pesticide applicators and growers. Uh, that's Irene. Calderon, if, if there is ever a, a, a pesticide issue, uh, as far as a, a bee kill issue, she's the one that you're going to be calling and, and she'll be handling handling that. And then we have Lindsay Tolman, she's one of our main outreach people as far as doing uh, workshops, uh, pesticide applicator workshops and, and licensing and basically getting the word out there. They're also the ones that, that run our drift watch and field watch uh, programs and, and keep those up and going. Moving on in to drift watch, I'm not sure, uh, sitting at the table I, I noticed a, a lot of you might not be aware of drift watch. Basically what this is, is a, a program where you can go online, it's <coughs> paid for through state funds, um, so it's, it's free to you, for you to use in, in the state of New Mexico. Uh, you can go online, you can register the locations of your apiaries, and then uh, commercial applicators and uh, <coughs> growers have access uh, to basically check an area if they're going to do an application and see if bees are present in that area. And then they can either, they, they know to either avoid it or, or spray it at times that, that reduce, reduce risks to the bees. But this one uh, basically shows how drift watch works. You're gonna it, it works not only for bees but like for your organic farms. If any of it, anybody in here does organic farming, um, you can register your location, and then it's not it's not set up in New Mexico yet because our legislative laws don't don't let us use it for regulatory purposes. But in other states, if we do get to ch changing some of our regulations, um, do have part of the program set up where if your bees are in a certain area and an applicator goes in, a lot of applicators are required to go in and uh, make note of where they're going to go make an application, it'll send a text message to or an email to the beekeeper letting, letting them know something's going to go on in that area. And this is something we've been looking at. It's just our, our laws don't don't quite allow that at this point. And then in, in our outreach, um, another big thing we're we're looking at, at focusing on. Um, hopefully, with with your cooperation and, and with the cooperation of the New Mexico State University and the Cooperative <coughs> Extension, we really want to get into focusing on some. Specific training uh, programs like maybe grow by control or uh, hive management and, and or even pesticide application where we actually get out in the field, uh, get together a group of people and, and, and just get them up, up to date on, on what's out there and how we can better keep our pollinators alive. Now this is where I really need, need your input. Um, where we're moving forward, other than everything we've kind of kind of shown so far, we really don't don't know where to go. Um, 
we have our ideas, uh, possibly developing on paper some best management practices for gray theories or uh, pesticide applicators, um, registering registering hives with drip watch, going through possibly changing our laws to to where applicators register their uh, their applications. Speaking of uh, commercial applicators anyway, it's going to be something that we, that's going to be hard to focus on homeowners. Um, and then we want to develop a web page that um, basically provides all this information uh, to somebody who can come, come take a look at it and really understand, okay, I don't need to spray when bees are out foraging at this time. I can possibly do it at night when they're not around. Um, but we also need your ideas. What, um, anything that you guys think can, can help protect protect your bees, we, we want to know about it. And just a, a few things that, that have been pending for the last few years that we've been trying to consider is uh, registration for non-commercial apiaries. Uh, if we we touched on this um, as far as doing even a non-fee based registration uh, really give us a, a better picture of where colonies are located in our state and how many colonies we have out there. Uh, right now our registration only consists of commercial apiaries which as of this year we've got five registered commercial apiaries so when we go to legislature and ask them okay we want to change these rules uh, for better protection of our apiary industry. They look at those five commercial apiaries and they kind of say, well, how much money is this really bringing into the state? Uh, and how much is it going to affect somebody else? So if we have a good representation of how many colonies are actually out there, we can, can better move our program along and, and hopefully increase funding for it. Um, it, it also gives us a better idea if we have a pest interception, who to go talk to, who's close proximity, um, so we can take a look at their, their hives and hopefully uh, stop the spread of, of any invasive pests that may come into the state. Um, and then it also supports our apiary education program. It gives us a lot more justification of going out in the field and doing these trainings uh, as far as bee health Best, best, best risk or best mitigation. I think that's not all I have, but any any input as far as ideas is, is welcome. Direction of taking our pollinator protection plan. Yes. Yes, it'll be, uh, it'll be Repeat a... the question. Repeat the question. Oh, sorry. Oh. What was asked is if, when we get the, the results of the pesticide analysis um, from the bee survey, if we'll be sharing it with the, the organization. And absolutely, you, um, we'll have access, you guys will have access to that. I was hoping to actually have the data before, before the meeting this year so I could kind of present on that, but just with the, the backlog of, of other uh, samples that the lab has to run, they, they haven't been able to run those yet. Yes, sir. Um, are the, uh, the sprayers that go in neighborhoods, you know, um, you know for, 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 residential, for residential spray, are they required to look at uh, drift watch or um, just best to give them a call and say, look, I've got bees here? It, it's definitely a good idea. Um, the, or, let me go ahead and repeat the question so everybody can, can hear one. Um, for residential applicators um, and applicators conducting pesticide uh, sprays in, in areas that, that there may be bees, are they required to uh, take a look at your drift watch or, or is it best to, for the 
the apiaries to, to contact them. In New Mexico, they, they're not required at this point to look at Driftwatch. Um, however, they are bound by the the label and the by the law to not uh, conduct a misapplication that may harm bees. So Driftwatch is a tool for them uh, to use. But it, it is always good if you have, especially if you have an applicator, say a pest control company that you see in the area relatively often, give them a call. They'll they'll be more more than happy to uh, jot down your location and take that into consideration as far as times when they're going to go out and, and possibly treat a house or, 